This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Welcome back, everybody, to Wells Tech. This is episode 341 for Tuesday, May, ter- May 13th, 2014. This is a show where we talk about technology and ministry, and we do it every Tuesday. And we have a good old time, and helping me do that is Sally Draper. Hi, Sally. Hey, Martin. How are you today? I am fine. Ask me how Happy I birthday. <laughs> it's my birthday. Look, I even brought a birthday crown. How cute is that, huh? <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It and is you spend a... it working, and then now you're spending it in this with... little party we call Wells Tech. Right, with a lot of my closest friends, the Wells Tech audience. What better way to spend it? And you know what? I have some good friends at Google, too. Did you see the Google Doodle of the day? I did not. We had to see the Google Doodle well, of the made day. I thought but didn't uh, remember it. <laughs> Actually, I don't think you would see the same Google Doodle as I do. This Google Doodle Holy came up cow. for me today, and when I hovered my mouse over it, let's see if I can do that, it says, come on, happy birthday, Sally. How about that? How does it know that? Huh? It's amazing, isn't it? Kind of makes you feel like Big Brother's watching you or something. Wow. Google's got my number, and I just was really surprised to see that today. Weird, <laughs> huh? Special. Yeah. That's actually very cool. I didn't know it. it uh, I didn't know they did that. Yeah. Learn something new on Wells Tech today, huh, Martin? Mm-hmm. Every day. <laughs> every day on Wells Tech. So, um, this is a. The second annual, not annual, the second uh, monthly second monthly that we do our little DIY, I'm not calling it a competition, mind you, our, our little DIY um, sharing session. So we pick a topic, uh, something that might be useful for a uh, ministry setting, a uh, personal workspace, you know, something that's going to help us all. Uh, be better stewards, get the job done, and um, I even forgot what we did last week or last month. It was the uh, iPhone or the uh, smartphone stand. Aren't you still using yours? Here's mine. No, it doesn't uh, fit the current phone I'm using, but yours is still in production. Mine's very functional. Okay, and pretty. Uh, absolutely. Just not engraved like mine was. <laughs> um, so, what's the topic for the day? What's our DIY challenge? We are going to do it yourself with taking care of cables and cords because all of us, I think, in the electronic age we live in have uh, a lot more electrical things around than than is practical to deal with real easily. So yep. there are lots of good ideas out there for um, managing those cords and doing it, I think, sometimes even in a pretty way. So yep. Mine's not pretty, DIY. but it's functional. So okay. I'm going to start... Um, first of all, I think a segment of this show ought to include how much it costs us because you brought in some artillery last month that really jacked up the price of your little DIY project. I used what I had available to me. That's what I'm going to say. That's how I'm going to defend that decision. Anyway, mine this week costs all of $4.16. Um, so what I needed that I didn't have was a little Velcro. So went to Menards and got the, uh, the the Velcro squares for those of you listening at home and I needed an exacto knife so those were my purchases and then uh, I took the approach and you've seen a lot of these there's a lot of uh, cable management solutions in, in DIY blogs and Lifehacker and those kinds of things but I didn't see one exactly like what I came up with so I did a little modification so I took a uh, can't fit it all on the screen here. I took a um, wrapping paper roll, or what's left of it, and you will need to find one that's a little bit bigger than normal. So the bigger, actually, the better, because you're going to actually carry. It's going to carry your cables. And what I did was I cut uh, holes in the side, three holes. So it's a three-foot-long um, 
wrapping paper uh, container, three holes equidistant, and then Velcro on the top, which attaches underneath your desk. Uh, this this actually worked. It, it looks it looks terrible. I'll, I'll admit <laughs> that I get zero style points, but its functionality is awesome. And uh, rather than some of the things that I had seen before didn't actually have any holes in them, you just kind of stuffed one in the other side and tacked it up underneath the desk. But the holes actually make it very functional because uh, you can run in the run the cable in. I've got a cable here, so you can run the cable in from one end, let's say the jack in the wall, and then you can uh, pop it through the appropriate hole at the appropriate place in your desk. And one of the good things about having something a little bit bigger like this is obviously you can fit more cables, but the uh, kind of the bulky ends of the uh, some of these cables, and you really want to kind of measure for the for the largest end that you have, will fit through this hole. Also, because you've got this extra length, and you probably wouldn't want to do this with an Ethernet cable, but with some of your USB cables or your power cables, you can fold them over to kind of tuck in excess cables. So you've got a you've got a way to uh, to uh, to push these out in the appropriate spot on your desk, but then also stuff in the rest that uh, that you really don't need to to see. So this isn't something that's going to win any style points. But uh, for me, this worked great because I've got a, a longer desk with a number of items. So I've got an external speaker, I have a computer, and an external monitor. And all those cables fit in here and pop out at the appropriate holes. And I haven't really affixed this in any way other than, than Velcro to keep it attached. So it's not a permanent structure. One other one that I saw that was really cool, that kind of a similar concept, is you get a rain gutter, a plastic or a vinyl rain gutter, and that one you actually have to screw in to something, the wall or underneath your desk, and then you it just kind of acts as a cable tray. But this kind of keeps it a little bit more contained and uh, it's a whole lot cheaper and easier to install. So that is my attempt at uh, a DIY cable management solution. You know, the thing I like about that one, Martin, um, style-wise, it really doesn't matter because you don't see those cables when they're up underneath your desk like that. It right. gets them up off the floor. It keeps your floor looking nice under your desk. So that That's sounds the, like a great solution to me. It worked for me. And uh, didn't I could have done a little bit better job with the holes. You can see that they're a little bit uh, um, inconsistent, even though I tried to use a template. But the uh, exacto knife I had uh, struggled a little bit with the... Uh, the weight, and you do want something pretty weighty, uh, so just your your normal, you know, smaller wrapping paper uh, rolls may not even be uh, strong enough. So this is actually a little bit heavier duty one. So, all right. What do you bring to the table, Great solution. virtual girl? Well, I have quite a lot to share with you because my starting point um, for all research. Uh, style-wise, and this is a style issue, you want to look good, is to go to Pinterest, of course. So I, I even put together a whole board of Pinterest picks with all different ideas for dealing with electrical cables. So it's my DIY board. I'll be adding to it over time as I come across others. But right now, it's it's just started with, with these different ideas. And you can see things like... Um, I think that rain gutter idea was on Pinterest, actually. So you can see oh, really? um, examples of that. That's this one right here. So, yeah, so there's lots of ideas out there in Pinterest land about dealing with cables. So one of the things I found right away that sparked my interest was the use of washi tape. Martin, have you ever heard of washi tape? It sounds Japanese. Yeah, I think it is. I think it originated from Japan. It's pretty much just your standard scotch tape, but it's decorative. And one of these only costs like $1.99, so that's cheaper than what you spent because washi tape can be used to identify your cables. So you could do something really simple, like put washi on each end of your cable. I don't know if I'm holding it too close or what. Yep, I see it. Yep. But, nice. you know, it gets really confusing when you have to figure out which plug to unplug, which one is, is tied to what. So if you put it on both ends of whatever cables you're dealing with, that's just a really cheap and easy way to be able to identify them. And, of course, if you have a washi tape collection, you can do some different colors and combinations on each different cable. So then I applied um, washi tape 
in a similar fashion to another type of cardboard roll, I use toilet paper rolls. And I put my washi tape on the toilet paper rolls, and then as you suggested, you can fold your cable and put it inside. So this is washi, this is mustache washi tape. This would be for the masculine people in my life. They could have mustache labeled cables and mustache labeled toilet paper rolls and keep their cables all organized nicely. Yes. You can also um, use the washi tape on your electrical cords. And I don't know how well you can see that, but the washi is on my toilet paper roll. It's on the ends here to identify. And then it's actually decorating my entire cord. My goodness, how exciting is that? So no style with Martin. you got style with me. But mine's going to lay on the floor. I think it would be better if it was up underneath the desk like your Velcro solution. So, yeah. But, yeah, especially cable identification. If you've got a bunch of them, it's, it's really... Normally, what has to happen if you're doing any kind of uh, rerouting is you got to unplug everything mm -hmm. and start from scratch, and it's really tough because you don't know what goes with what because you got so many USB cables and different uh, connector types and whatever. That's uh, that's a great idea, a little personal flair. And you know, if you buy your roll of washi tape for a dollar ninety nine, there's like three lifetimes worth of supply on this little bitty roll because you want to do so much more with your washi tape. So there are washi projects galore. You can put it on your phone. You can decorate candles. You can decorate your ceiling fan with washi tape if you so desire. So don't think that I'm giving you a solution that is just for electrical cords. Right. We've got you covered in all kinds of ways. So Beautiful. A little bonus. Yeah, Langyap, they call Langyap. that. Langyap, yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, so that is our DIY project for the month, cable management. Uh, you can, uh, uh, if you have different solutions, and I know every techie struggles with this, uh, please share those, wellstech at wells.net, or uh, go to the show notes page and connect with us via one of our social networks, and uh, love to hear your cable management solution DIY or otherwise I think that's a good thing to share so nicely done Sally absolutely fun stuff let's move on to our interview of the week uh, this is a, a uh, repeat interview Peter Frank from Concordia Technology Solutions was gracious enough to join us once again he's a manager there a product manager and uh, he had some interesting news and a uh, couple of new products are coming out of Concordia. They are the makers of Shepherd Staff, which a lot of our churches use, and now they've got the Church 360 product, and we've talked about the Member 360 uh, portion of that, and uh, that's a good church management solution, online church management solution, those congregations that are looking to kind of go online with that, you know, that same product set, a lot of the same features as Shepherd Staff, but they have two new products, Ledger, which is their finance finance product, and eGiving, which is their online giving solution. So we asked Peter to come on and explain those to us and share the good news that is these products are now available to Wells congregations at a discounted price. So here's our interview with Peter Frank. We are very pleased to have once again Peter Frank, manager of Concordia Technology Solutions down there in uh, the St. Louis area. Good morning, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. We've had you on before, and there's been a couple of product releases since then, so we thought it would be an appropriate time to, to bring you back once again. Uh, yeah. but before maybe we jump into that, uh, refresh us and our audience as to who you are and your responsibilities there at uh, CTS. Sure. Well, Concordia Technology Solutions is the church administration division of Concordia Publishing House. So we develop church management software. We've been in the business for years. Now we've had um, DOS-based applications back in the 80s. In 1994, we released Shepherd Staff, which has been our top-selling church management software for years, and we still have thousands of churches using it. And then a few years ago, we ventured into the web-based church management software market with Church 360 members. 
and that's what we talked about last time, and, and that is doing very well. Um, it's continually growing, and it's part of a, a software suite. Included with that is Church 360 Unite, our website builder, but the latest edition is Church 360 Ledger, the church finance software portion of the software suite. So we released that back in December, and then we also have um, a, a new partnership for mm -hmm. online giving for, for a product called eGiving, and we work with Vanco um, Processing with for that. So we'll talk about those three or those Great. two things together. Great. Uh, just a quick question on uh, Church 360 members. Uh, that's the online version, and I know that's been what a year, or a year and a half out there on on the market. Yes. Uh, a little bit more than that. We really? officially launched it September 2012, so okay. we're, we're going on almost two years soon. So a okay. um, yeah, year and a half is is accurate. How has that been received? Is there have there have you had a lot of uh, conversions from Shepherd staff to that, or a lot of uh, you know, new script sub subscriptions who hadn't maybe been in the CTS family? Well, we do have both. Those who have converted from Shepherd Staff are the ones who thought Shepherd Staff was a little bit too big and bulky or who wanted to go online with their church management software. We see that especially with smaller churches who have fewer people in the church office and rely heavily on volunteers. Having it be web-based allows the volunteers to do their tasks from home. So entering an attendance, entering an offering, you don't have to open up the church office for them to do that. So we found that the smaller churches using Shepherd staff uh, much prefer Church 360 members over that. We've also branched out into a lot of new markets and gotten new customers because um, Shepherd staff d still is, is more feature rich at this point and, and it probably will be. It's got 20 years of development into it all based on customer feedback. Uh, so they both serve two very distinct purposes and, and people have really taken to each of them. Um, in fact our customer base has about doubled since the last time we spoke. So it's just continuing to grow. Do you have any medium or larger size churches using the uh, member 360 product? We do, yes, absolutely. Um, we Most of them are in the under 400 weekly attendance, although we do have a few churches that are over that and who do find it useful. Uh, it's very flexible, so it can be for any size church, um, but it's because it doesn't have the breadth of features, um, some people still prefer Shepherd staff, but um, it works really well for what it does, and people have been very pleased. So, Peter, um, I understand that a very popular component of Shepherd staff is the finance module. And uh, when you first rolled out Member 360, there wasn't the finance module online uh, to go along with that, but now there is with um, the Church 360 Ledger. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that product and maybe how it's different than the Shepherd Staff Finance Module? Sure. Well, like I mentioned, our, our primary target is the smaller church, and the smaller churches often do not have a financial expert. So we kept that in mind as we were developing Church 360 Ledger. So um, we had two types of customers. We had the, the CFO. Often you'll find a church is like a retired accountant. Um, my, I, I look at the person in my church who is a retired CFO from a local hospital. He knows his finances inside and out. He knows credits and debits. And um, we want to make sure that it did everything that he would need it to do. But on the other hand, we have churches who rely on volunteers, people who may not have um, any kind of financial expertise. Uh, my mom actually helps at a church with their finances, and, and she does not know much about finances. I think I passed her up in math in junior high, and, and she'd be the first to say that. But she's been asked to help, and she's a willing volunteer. And so we have that person in mind, too, the person who knows how to balance a checkbook but doesn't know how to use credits and debits. And so as we went about developing Church 360 Ledger, we made it robust enough to handle all the journal entries and, and the things that the the true financial experts would need, but made it simple enough that it would lead the general users down paths such as payments or deposits or transfers. So it's very simple to use. You can um, get up and run it in a matter of minutes. Setting up your chart of accounts is um, a much more visual process than it was in Shepherd Staff. 
staff and Shepard's staff, it relied heavily on numbers, uh, account numbers, that every two digits meant something very specific. And that was confusing to some of our, our more novice users. And so we made this so that you don't have to worry about account numbers, that Ledger handles that for you. Ledger leads you through that process of determining an asset versus a liability. So it's um, it's much easier to use and besides all that it's web based so again the smaller churches who have the the volunteers at home can log on at any time and use it um, you know, view account balances enter transactions uh, we've built in different security permissions knowing that there are many people who want to see that information but who should not have the authority to change it so we've got permission groups where it could be read only for very specific accounts so for example if the youth leader has been doing a lot of fundraising and wants to see where their current balance is, you could give them access to the youth ministry account and they can view the totals, but they can't do anything with it. And so they can be they can stay informed, um, but not change anything that they shouldn't be changing. So um, what's actually kind of neat about this is we've gone through the process and we've talked to customers about you know, where was it that Shepherd Staff Finance wasn't meeting their needs. We actually took a lot of that learning and improved Shepherd Staff Finance along the way. So we're very pleased to have two great options, again, to provide the, our customers who have very different needs. I see that it has printable checks as a part of it as well. Yeah, we've been working with um, Forms Plus Inc. They're out of Georgia and great company. Um, they've been doing the Shepherd Staff, the pre-printed checks for Shepherd Staff for almost as long as we've had Shepherd Staff and we've been very pleased with our work and relationship with them. One of the things we heard from our Shepherd Staff customers is that we were too limiting by having only the middle checks where you'd have the check in the middle part of the paper and then the, um, the stubs on the top and the bottom. And a lot of churches said, you know, it'd be make much more sense to just have it on the top. So you can see there on that screenshot that we do offer both of those in Church 360 Ledger, and that comes directly from customer feedback. Very good. I, I would assume, and I think maybe we discussed this when we talked about uh, the members' product, is uh, maybe a reticence on the part of some congregations to go online and the security of their data. What does Concordia do to... Uh, put them at ease and let them know that they, this is a secure place. We use the same kind of security that online banks use. Um, so, you know, it's becoming very common to go check your balances online and, and make transactions with your actual dollars online. And so with Church360 Ledger, we use that same kind of security. On the other hand, we are not actually processing money through that. So it's... Um, if by some chance somebody was to get in, like there was a recent heart bleed um, virus that, or security breach, if you will, that came out, um, even if that was to happen again, there's no actual transactions that take place with actual money. Now, um, because of that, because it is financial information, it is very sensitive, we're always working our hardest to make sure that it's as secure as possible. So when that Heartbleed thing came out, we had recovered from that within hours of the announcement and, and made sure, and, and we had actually no vulnerabilities um, that did occur. So we're making sure that we're always on the top of the security within the industry. We're watching what other companies do, and I don't have any concerns. I don't think our churches should either. Great. Speaking of finances and security, another exciting product that you mentioned at the top of the show that has really just came out, you know, maybe a couple weeks ago, is the e-giving product. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, as you know, Concordia Publishing House has been doing offering envelopes for years, and, and we have thousands of churches who use that. And, and they were telling us that they really wanted to have an online giving option. And uh, with online giving, again, going back to security, that's that's where transactions are actually happening. And, and we made the decision as a company that we did not want to pursue the payment processing for um, because it's such a complex area, and that's not really our core business. So what we did is we went out and we talked with a bunch of companies who were doing it, and we found that Vanco Services um, was the top in the industry. They've been doing online giving for a long time, so we partnered with them to um, create a product that we call eGiving. Now, um, Vanco does all of the payment processing, and, and they are PCI Level 1 compliant, the, the best security that you can possibly get. And again, they've been doing this for years, so we partnered with them, and we're offering a joint product together 
together to our churches. Um, and we are furthering that partnership by now integrating it within Church 360 members and shepherd staff. So when members go online and give, their contributions are automatically downloaded into the church management software. So in the case of shepherd staff, the, the church office administrator just clicks one button and it shows the list of electronic offerings and they approve them and they get assigned to the people. And Church 360 members, um, it, they just set up their account and the transactions, the contributions are automatically added to their records and they can have the contribution statements within a few hours after the donation was given. And Vanco's got some great things there. You'll see our, um, the mobile option so that people can give their offering from their phone. If you're like me and you forget your offering envelope or your check, uh, that, that has happened so much more frequently now that we have a son. You know, as we <laughs> rush to as we rush to get out of the house, we forget the offering. And, and so this is a great way to then go back home and be able to donate or set up a reoccurring offering. Um, so you can give every week or every month. Or you can say give um, X amount on the 15th of every month. It really helps provide more consistent giving for the members and for the church as well. Another neat feature of that is because it's payment processing. Churches that take payment for different things, like I know some churches will have a registration fee for VBS, now they can offer their members the opportunity to register and pay for it online. And so it does not just have to be for charitable giving, it can be for any kind of payment processing that the church needs. Very good. And it looks like e-check as well as credit debit cards, yes? Yes, exactly. And I know there's some churches that are very sensitive to having their members donate or, or give um, by way of credit card. Um, so churches don't want them to take out any debt to donate to the church. And so you have the option to pick which one of those payment options. You could do only checks, or you could do checks and debit, or you could do all three. Um, so it really is based on the church's needs and preferences. So um, they've been doing the check handling for um, many years, and then a few years back is when they branched into credit and debit processing too. So it's really up to the church what they'd like to go with. Great. Uh, obviously, fees for both of these products, um, it looks like they tie in, uh, the ledger fees tie in nicely to your member um, and other subscriptions online through Church360. Um, and then the fees for the, the e-giving look like they are more coordinated with Vanco and processing fees for swipes and things like that. Exactly, and so um, you'll see right there. There are there's a, a monthly web hosting fee. So if you want to have the e-giving portion, um, so the credit and debit besides just the the check handling, if you want to have that interface where the church office and the members can log in, which most people do, it is a a twenty five dollar a month web hosting fee for that. And then there's a there's fees per transactions. Um, so there'll be a um, for like the check handling there, you see 25 cents per transaction. And there's ways to set that up to ask the members to pay that fee or the church themselves can do it. But it's such a, a minimal amount um, that most churches have, have not had any problem with that. And then with credit and debit, it's a certain percentage of the transaction. Um, and that's just for handling credit card and debit card payments. So to cover that, but it's it's very minimal. There are additional things you can purchase, such as the mobile card reader, um, the little box that sits on top of your cell phone, or the desktop card reader. So those are great for um, taking payment at different events. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So it's very minimal, and actually right now there's a special promotion that um, Vanco just announced where um, they waive the $50 setup fee and then the, 25, the first two months of web hosting, uh, that's $25 each. So if you signed up now, it would save your church $100 right from the beginning. And they run promotions like that frequently. And the Church 360 Ledger product for Wells Congregations is priced at $20 a month if it's purchased along with the... Uh, Church 360 members product, which is, I Correct. believe, like $26.99. We've uh, got a great relationship with Concordia that we value, and uh, they're giving us that special discount for our Wells congregations. So, Yes, yeah, so we have more and more churches signing up every day with that discount. It's been great. Great. Good. 
Peter, thank you for taking the time to, to share this great news with us. This Hi, is, uh, I think, uh, something that would have a lot of interest in many congregations who are looking to go online, and simplifying it for that volunteer workforce is, is really important as well. So I think you guys are certainly headed in the right direction. Well, thank you. I sure appreciate it. We love serving the churches. Any th way that we can use technology to, to make church life easier and allow the church workers to focus on the, the ministry and, and working with people, we look for those opportunities. Very good. Thanks again, Peter. Thank you. All right. Uh, again, thanks to Peter for his uh, willingness to come on the show again and talk about uh, a new product. They keep rolling out new products, so we got to keep having them come back. A number of our congregations, I don't know what the numbers are, but a significant number of our congregations take advantage of their, of their products and I think find them very useful. Yeah, it's exciting to see things going to the web more and more and, and knowing that it's a quality product with a lot of years of development behind it. And a great manager. I just think Peter's the nicest guy. He's always been so pleasant to, to talk with on the show. And they're doing they're doing a nice job for a relatively small staff, and their support staff is all equally friendly. I don't know, Sal, if you've ever talked to them over there, but uh, mm -hmm. always willing to spend as much time as necessary to to walk you through not just the problems, but uh, questions that you might have about how to do things. So the the support is is excellent there at Concordia. Yeah, you know how much that means to you when you need it, and and they're there for you. So that's sure. great. Um, so that's a great ministry resource, but we. Don't stop there on the Wells Tech Podcast. We have another ministry resource that you wanted to share with us, Sally. I will do that after Google starts behaving for me. Let me share uh -oh. my screen. And I am going to point you to Lightstock.com. Lightstock.com is a new um, stock photography site specifically for the church. And I think they also have video footage as well. Um, these aren't free, I don't believe. There may be some freebies on the site. Um, but they are definitely um, high quality images. So here's a collection about Bible study. And I think um, for those of you that can see my screen through the video podcast, you'll agree that there's some really nice imagery included here. So if you're interested in a particular image, then you would go there. I think you have to buy um, some kind of tokens right. or something, right. credits. And, and then when you go to download it, um, it costs a different number of credits depending on um, the number of pixel dimensions you want to you wanna get of the photo. So, but if you're looking for just that one special photo, it might be worth paying $5 for it to, to have the right thing to fit um, whatever your sermon is or Website whatever. Website or brochure mm -hmm. or bulletin, whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, they, they feature all different kinds of collections and, and they do say um, video footage as well. So I don't think it's just photography, but you can get video footage as well from the site. Cool. So probably worth adding to your, to your tool belt and uh, referencing in the future. Certainly, I, it's something I encourage congregations to think about uh, making more use of, whether it be around some of their events or sermon series or promotional materials. Just find good quality um, stock photography and uh, use it. You, know, you don't overuse it, but certainly consider using it. It's it's so inexpensive. It's not it's, it's not really that expensive at all to use it. So. You know, and I think we we have this big shift now to um, storytelling, and 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 pictures are worth a thousand words. You know, you can just convey so much with the right photo in the right location. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that, Sally. Uh, we do have a couple weeks left. If you want to contribute your own ministry resource, just like Sally did, enter to win a, an Apple TV, which we'll be giving away the second or the first Tuesday in June, maybe when we're right. at uh, Kettle Moraine Lutheran for their uh, for their teach and tech. And uh, also, we have another category that uh, you can contribute to, and that's listener reviews. If you have something that uh, you've tried out, uh, a product, a service, hardware, software, website, whatever, and want to write up a little review or do a little YouTube video review, you will be entered to win a Nexus 7 tablet. Uh, both of those will be given away in June. So time is running out, and the list is actually pretty short, so your chances are very good. 
<laughs> yeah, I think like Ryan Rosenthal style. is Ryan Rosenthal's on both lists, and he has been a, a Wells Tech winner in the past. I bet he's hoping that the list stays short because he, he gets it about the list being short. Right. We need your contributions. We'd love for Ryan to win, but we'd love for you to win as well. So send them in, folks. Exactly. <laughs> Let's move on to our tips of the week. And uh, my tip is something that uh, was recently launched and that is the ability to mute people on Twitter. Now there was a big controversy a number of months back where you could block people and you know the, they know you blocked them, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a little bit different. So if you wanted to uh, uh, maybe turn the noise down a little bit on one of the people that you follow, but you don't just want to remove them, let's say you just don't want to see any of their tweets, but you still want to be able to maybe uh, have them see yours or direct message them. So stay in that kind of a relationship versus you know seeing all the all their tweets about uh, their house hunting or their dog walking or their meals or, or whatever. Or maybe they're on vacation and you're not all that interested in seeing all their vacation photos. You can mute them. Uh, you simply go into their um, into their profile. So I'll just pick one here. And there is a little gear icon next to the the uh, following link. So I'm already following this particular uh, Twitter user. If I click the gear icon right next to that, third one down says mute, and then the name of the the profile account. And if you click that, then they will be muted, and it'll say you'll no longer see tweets from them. And then you can undo it, obviously, uh, at, at a later date. And then you also get a little icon that shows up that shows that they are in a muted state. So you can uh, click on that and unmute and mute them. So nice little addition, I think, to Twitter, especially if you are a, a, a big Twitter user and have a lot of followers and you want to kind of turn down the volume a little bit, and especially to, to some of the more chatter, chattery folks. Um, you can uh, you can take steps now to, to mute them either permanently or just uh, for, for a little while. So that is my tip of the week. So that's interesting insight, Martin. You don't care for those dog on the walk kind of photos <laughs> like we see a lot of. Huh? <laughs> only if my only if my grandchild is involved. Oh, in the there you go. Life changes when you become a grandpa. Huh? You can't. <laughs> You can't follow everybody. Yeah, that's true. All right, I'm going to talk about a social media tip as well. Mine's about Facebook. Um, if I can get my screen to share properly. Uh, Facebook announced last week that there's going to be a new look for Facebook pages, a streamlined look. And it's kind of funny because it seems to me that I remember Facebook behaving this way. You know, right now on your Facebook um, profile or your page, you get kind of a two-column look and you have to kind of go back and forth between the columns. Well, they're going now to just a, a sidebar that has some more static kind of information and a main uh, column with the flow of conversation on the page. And, uh, you know, I think it's kind of coming back around to the way it used to be if memory serves. But, um, you know, worth paying attention to and being aware of if you've got some uh, content stakes in Facebook for your church or school or whatever it may be. Um, just be aware that things may be changing, and this is a good article that gives you an overview um, where you're going to find your admin links, all those different kind of things about your Facebook page. Um, I guess for me it just serves as a good reminder. I, I, I like it when people, when churches have Facebook pages as part of their communication strategy, but just remember who owns your Facebook page and it's not you. Uh, <laughs> Facebook true. has the ability to do whatever they want with their service that they're giving to you for free and um, they are likely to change it further in the future. So um, make sure your communication strategy centers hopefully around your own website that you have um, control and permission to to do with what you want and not centers on Facebook's ever-changing uh, face. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's my recommendation, a good read for Facebook page users. Excellent. Yeah, Facebook is one of those, you know, love them, hate them, double-edged swords where they provide some valuable, valuable services for people interested in in ministry activities and, and using social networks because everybody's on it. But uh, 
you have to kind of work around some of the stuff that, that they throw at you because they're in the business to make money, not necessarily to uh, make it easy for you to, to use it uh, as a church or as an individual even. Yeah. All right, I'm going to dive right in then and give my pick of the week since I'm on a roll. And I'm going to point you to a page on Amazon where you can get a free Kindle download. And this is for today. I'm not sure how long this deal is going to last. Um, but this is the Book of Psalms. It's a very special um, translation slash revision of the Book of Psalms done by a group called the Wartburg Project. Were you aware of the Wartburg Project, Martin? I am. Yeah. yeah. I just found out about it, and apparently it's a group of Wells and ELS theologians who, uh, separate from synod mandates or synod support or anything, are looking at um, translating the Bible, and they're doing it under the name The Wartburg Project. I corresponded a little bit with the editor-in-chief, that's Professor John Brug from uh, Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, and he told me a little bit of the background and some of the philosophy behind it, but he also told me that coming very soon they're going to have a website about the project and the efforts there. Currently it's just a volunteer project, a group of people that have gotten together um, to look at this potential, and the Book of Psalms and also the Gospel of Matthew are currently available for Kindle. Um, Professor Brooks said it's not really their intention to put all the books out in Kindle format as they're developed or anything like that, but that they wanted to put these books out to give people a flavor of what direction they were going with the project. And so you have an Old Testament book, a New Testament book. Um, just so happens that currently, as of May 13th, the Book of Psalms is free for, for Kindle. Um, the, the Gospel of Matthew is currently 99 cents. So you can get them both today for 99 cents. So just a heads up about an interesting project. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about it in the future. Wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can hook up with those guys and talk a little bit about their publishing experience with uh, with Amazon because this is a, a very real time project, and I'm sure that it hasn't been too long that these translations have been done. Now they've they've been making them available on uh, on Amazon. Very cool. All right. The book of Book of Psalms says it was published on April 17th, so yeah, it hasn't so been there less long. than a month old. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, my pick of the week, and let me go back to my, my screen, and that is uh, Google Slides. used to be called Google Presentations, now Google Slides. Uh, they've done some nice, nice updates with this, and the reason that it's my pick is I'm using, first of all, I'm teaching a, a class on it at uh, Kettle Moraine Lutheran in June, so I figured I need to get a little bit smarter on some of the new features. But I'm also using it, I took advantage of, of maybe using it for a presentation I'm doing this weekend out in Los Angeles for uh, Los Angeles Area Metro, I'm going to get the name wrong, Evangelism Conference. And uh, so I'm doing uh, something on social, I'm doing three sessions, but I'm going to do them all in uh, Google Slides. And I was very, very impressed with the, uh, the functionality that Google has now built into their online offering. Um, kind of uh, feature for feature parity with what uh, Microsoft is doing with their online PowerPoint stuff, but you've got all the features that uh, you, you might think that you could have with master slide editing, transitions, animations, uh, the ability to uh, you know use all kinds of good topography, um, and uh, you know, spell checker, you can insert all kinds of things including images, links, video uh, embeds, word art, uh, shapes, tables, those kinds of things. And then it has a nice a viewer. That was one of, the, I think, the challenges that they had when they first started is that they didn't have a great way to, to view the slides. But now you can view the slides just like you can uh, with a slideshow viewer from PowerPoint or Keynote from the beginning or with, with speaker notes in a different window. You can even present to another device if you have uh, um, Google uh, Chromecast uh, mm -hmm. available. Uh, so you can present on on a big screen uh, directly from the from the presentation. But uh, kudos to Google; they've done a nice job. It's a it's a 
it's more and more elegant each release that they provide and uh, certainly easy to collaborate, comment and chat on um, so it can be a, one of those tools that uh, we're very comfortable using with like Google Docs where it can just be a, a collaborative experience and build this thing together. You can also enable offline editing which is one of the challenges with some of, this, with some of these online tools that well, what happens if you don't have the internet but now you have the ability to, to enable offline editing. So that is my pick of the week. Great pick, Martin. I'm all behind uh, using those Google products and it's exciting to see it um, ramping up and doing more and more over time. Okay. So, good stuff. Sally, we have a couple of dates we want to remind our listeners about. Yeah, definitely. Um, coming up this weekend in New Ulm, Minnesota is graduation and call day for Martin Luther College. And all those events are going to be streamed online if you go to the MLC website. Uh, right there from the home page you can get to this page with the streaming embedded on it ready to go. Information about all the events, concerts, um, call service, all of that. So exciting weekend here in New Ulm. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And also uh, to follow always is Wisconsin Lutheran Seminaries. Uh, vicar assignments, uh, graduate assignments, and graduation. And I think there's a concert thrown concert in there too. as well. Yep. So uh, live streaming hosted on the Wells live streams page, but you can get the information, dates, and link to all the information from the Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary page. So that's next week, uh, May 20th through 23rd. Uh, another date to remember is June 3rd. That's when Martin and I will be presenting. Martin will be doing uh, presentations or in general Google Slides and I'll be doing Google Forms at the KML Tech and Teach event. Um, and it's a full day of all kinds of breakout sessions for the bargain price of $30. And uh, you even get a little something extra. If you stay late you can see a live Wells Tech um, podcast broadcast because we're going to broadcast that afternoon uh, from KML at 4 p.m. our normal broadcast time. So looking forward to that. And then finally one more date to remember is the last week of July when Martin and I will be teaming up to offer Final Web training. Uh, Final Web is a web hosting platform that many of our congregations and schools use for their website and we're going to have some training there at the Center for Mission and Ministry, the beautiful uh, Senate headquarters in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And so come and join us for the training. It is filling up so if you want to get in I'd suggest you consider getting your registration filled out quickly. Super. That's what I got. We got links to all that in the show notes. Shh, yes, uh, wellstech.wells Net. On to our community feedback section. Yes, and I'm going to start with um, some comments that were recently shared on the Wells Tech listserv. I'll just point you to um, the listserv and we'll have links as well in the show notes to different uh, software that was mentioned. It basically stemmed from a question that Gail Potratz asked to the listserv community about uh, recommendations for church projection. So there are different, um, different slide options for church um, worship projection. Um, obviously you could use something like PowerPoint or even Google Slides I suppose if you wanted to. Um, but there are others that are geared specifically to church needs like Proclaim, Media Shout, and Pro Presenter. And various people kind of chimed in with how they're using those different tools in their congregation. Um, also, we had a Wells Tech interview not too long ago with uh, Jason Potosky and the pastor in his congregation, I want to say in um, Wyoming, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. So, so we'll have a link to all of that in the show notes if you're interested. Um, Gail's second part of her thing was about video recording, video editing, and there were some great links shared in that regard as well. So keep that listserv in mind, folks. Uh, you can join it. It's completely free. It's private and and uh, moderated, so hopefully no spam comes through the listserv or anything like that. But it's basically being able to ask a question of six to eight hundred of your closest Wells techie kind of friends. So um, a good place and always great information shared there. Great. All right, next up we heard from Pastor Rob Gunther who gave us a quick update on Automatic. Those of you that listen regularly may remember that Pastor Gunther bought a gadget 
to plug into his car computer, basically, and it logs um, all of his trips for him and keeps up with all kinds of uh, statistics on his trips. Um, and you know, he wrote to us. He was very excited to get it. I think the price tag is right around ninety-nine dollars. And he was, you know, feeling like it was going to be a big help to him as a pastor. Obviously, he makes a lot of calls on people and does a lot of traveling um, to carry out his day-to-day -day work. So here's what he said. He says, I'm loving the automatic that I purchased earlier this year. It took me a little while to get it all working the way I wanted, but it works great now. He uses if, this, then, that to actually write the results out to a Google spreadsheet. And... Um, he says, I just drive around and once a week or so, I go to my spreadsheet, put an X in the first column if it was a business trip for church or school, and some notes in the far right so I know where I went. And if it doesn't remember, there's a link right there that shows me a map. I think I even have a link that I can include in the show notes that will show a sample map, which is pretty cool. It has like the GPS coordinates of where he traveled and things. Well, if he so, forgot where that trip was, he'd right. remind himself because he knows where, they, where he stopped and where he came back from. Yeah. Exactly. Pretty cool stuff. So, you know, I remember the days of trying to keep up with mileage records and past responsibilities, and, and it's a hassle. <laughs> you always forget to write something down and, and turn it in in a timely fashion and stuff, and this just really gets rid of the those barriers. So I appreciate your review, Pastor Gunther. Wonderful. Um, next that's from... for iOS only, just as a reminder. I think it only works with iPhones. Okay. You have to be in the iOS family for that to, to work. Very good. All right. Um, a few links were shared via Digo. We have a, a Wells Tech group on Digo where you can share links. The first one from Jason Winjet um, to no mix-ups. And there's actually an article from a church tech blog that he pointed to about keeping your audio video equipment um, well labeled. And it's basically a high quality labeling system. You can see it's kind of a little plasticky almost. Instead of just tape and a, a marker or whatever to go on your mixer board in your church, you can actually put um, nice high quality uh, labels on your equipment. So no mixups.com. Cool. Um, from another Jason, this time Jason Schmidt, this is a page for the International Space Station. And it actually has a live video feed that you can watch as the space station moves around uh, the world. I watched it earlier in the day and it wasn't dark. You can see over on this side that the space station is down here off the tip of South America and it's in the dark part of the world at this point. So all we're seeing is a black picture and the edge of the space station equipment. But you can actually come here and watch it. It moves pretty fast actually. Um, I was pretty surprised when I came back to the page later in the day how far, what a what an amazing distance it had traveled, but um, you can see live footage of the Earth from the International Space Station. That's so cool. It is. All right. Um, then I had a couple that I tagged on Digo. This one I just thought was interesting. I was doing some reading, and there was there is a Flickr group. For some reason, it's not displaying. There it goes. Of people that do um, sketch type notes, and this is just kind of a meme, a sketch note they call it where they draw out their sermons or a Bible study in the sketch format. So you've probably seen uh, this done with other presentations, and I just thought it was really unique that they had applied that concept to sermons and Bible study and included yeah. sketchy notes. That's really a thing. I mean, if you if you search on sketch notes, there's, mm -hmm. there's whole uh, ecosystem around applications for it. There are tutorials on it. You can find a lot of YouTube videos. There's products, physical products that you can use, and even training to uh, to teach you how to sketch a little bit better, even if you're not an artist. And it's really not that hard. So interesting. Yeah, I thought it was really neat to see these done in a biblical fashion. I think I'd need a lot of training to be this artistic. Maybe oh, if I, I could use my washi tape, that might that might do the yes. trick. I don't know. Um, finally, um, I personally uh, tagged a blog post called Seven Reasons Why Pastors Should Create Podcast. So if you're looking for a little motivation, here are some considerations. In particular, it's focusing on the fact that you're delivering a sermon every week. And if your sermons are any good, then why not share them um, via 
audio recordings on the internet, basically. And they give you some ideas here and some motivation. So if you're considering it, you might want to read this blog post. Um, and then finally, Martin, uh, you had an email specifically from uh, Tate Wagey, who's at Messiah in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and he was concerned. He was interested in looking for a solution for texting his congregation. And yeah. so, there were several links that you shared to different um, uh, products that exist for texting. Uh, they groups all of people. they all cost something, which is mm -hmm. kind of the downside. They all are kind of mainstream kinds of tools that maybe aren't just for churches, although they're kind of advertised in that space. Mm -hmm. But in general, they are um, you know, quality products. But the other suggestion I made to Tate was if you have a Twitter feed, uh, get the members that you're interested in communicating with to follow your Twitter feed and have them turn the auto uh, SMS notification on so that when you tweet something to a particular account then they'll get notified and that will cost you zero um, as far as sending these out so it, it might accomplish the same purpose just uh, in a little bit cheaper way. So. And we'll have a link in the show notes to all those different solutions so be sure to check out wellstech.wells.net Sally, we're going to do a show next week, I think, and um, I'm looking forward to it because the whether we believe it or not, if we look out the window and, and don't think that spring is here, it, it, it is, and summer will be here soon enough, and it's time to get in shape, mm -hmm. and technology is playing more and more a role in getting into shape with uh, fitness tracking devices and watches and things you can wear on your, on your belt or you know, in your pocket. Uh, your smartphone can uh, can do some tracking for you. So we're going to talk all about fitness tracking, taking care of the temple, so to speak. And we'll also have an interview with a professor there at MLC, Dan Gavrish, right? That's right. He is a professor of physical education, and he's up on all those kind of tools. So I'm really excited to talk to Dan and, and see what his recommendations are. Yeah. Sally, we also have a little kind of a variation of our music segment, uh, um, kind of a featured video of the week. What do we have this week? Yeah, this week we're going to um, have a video from Will's artist, Coin A. It's titled, Lord Jesus, You Have Come in Love. And what's especially exciting about this, Martin, is that we're starting a new curated playlist on YouTube with this video collection. Maybe we'll have several playlists actually because I don't know that they'll all necessarily be music videos but over time we have shared different videos that people have produced and now we're going to be kind of collecting those and so that people can turn to those playlists and find um, you know selections if they're looking for video ideas or whatever. So kind of a twofold uh, purpose in, in doing this. But looking forward to sharing Koine's video with you today. Cool. So go to the show notes page, wellstack.wellstack.net for that. Just want to remind everybody we do this show live every Tuesday afternoon, 4 o'clock Central Daylight Time. Wells Tech is it wellstechlive.wells.net? Sounds right to me. <laughs> so you can go there and you can see the live feed. Uh, just put a little note on your calendar every Tuesday, and if you can't make it, you can't make it, but we would love to have you and ask or participate in the conversation, make a comment. Uh, it's all possible through that Google Hangouts page, um, or you can just watch. But uh, please do consider joining us. If not, just consider uh, keeping us in your RSS reader and uh, get the video and the audio feeds and and uh, contribute to the show in other ways. We have uh, presence on Facebook, on Twitter, Google+. You can email us, Pinterest, of course. Oh, I was wondering if you were going to say Pinterest. I was holding my breath. Just lead with that, then I don't have to uh, <laughs> keep you in suspense. That's right. Uh, all kinds of ways to get in touch with us, or just go to the show notes page, wellstech.wells.net, and leave a comment for us. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate you are uh, the reason we do the show, and it's important for us to, to stay connected and stay on the same wavelength so that we can share great ministry ideas like we do each and every week. Thanks, Sally. I will talk to you next week.